Welcome to episode 29 of First Principles. I'm Rohan Dharmakumar, your host, and my guest for this episode is Karthik Jairam, the CEO and co-founder of Waycool Foods. Karthik's leadership style and philosophies were different from many of the earlier leaders and founders I've spoken with across the last 28 episodes of First Principles. Perhaps it's because he started Waycool, an agri-tech startup, after turning 40. He jokes that some people buy a Ferrari as a response to their midlife crisis instead he decided to start up. Waycool was last valued at over 700 million dollars. It's headquartered in Chennai and focused on South India. It's a distributor and processor of fresh produce, grains, staples and milk. And though it operates from the farm to fork, it is a supply chain company at its heart, says Karthik. One that tries to predict the demand from retailers and consumers and then work backwards to source the supply i know this might sound complex but karthik explains it really well and when he does you'll notice he has a very keen understanding of supply chains that's because before starting an agritech company karthik had been in the automotive industry for nearly 20 years he's also spent time as a consultant with mckinsey it's perhaps this offbeat combination that makes him somewhat different from many founders which in turn leads to a set of contrarian but humbly held perspectives on business and startups i noticed this when i asked him about a few first principles or mental models that he often turns to I, i'm i'm not sure what you mean by the definition of a mental model but there are i believe a few uh, you know axioms which uh, we should live with karthik goes on to list them one is any solution that we build also has to be in tune with its environment rather than you know i don't like the word disruptive let me put it that way and then he explains what he means by this how he's built way cool not to be disruptive but to complement the geographies it's in it's a business that sways with the landscape and tries to tread lightly karthik is also a founder who doesn't hesitate to admit where he's made mistakes before or where there are opportunities still to learn he also answers all my questions with examples and analogies and if you've been listening to first principles for a while you know that is something i love in this conversation we talk about the two questions that karthik asks to find out if an idea is truly novel when it comes to staple products where every commodity is similar how do you build a brand how he observes learns documents and implements knowledge and what the job of a ceo is oh and yeah apples oranges bananas and mangoes in fact just before going into the recording karthik told me how customers in nepal and certain northeastern states already recognize and buy oranges by brands that was news to me there's a lot to unpack and learn from in this conversation i hope you enjoyed as much as i did Yeah so I mean um, I'm just thrilled to have you here and um, in its and it's news to me that in India or in Nepal as you said oranges um, are recognized by brands you mentioned all fresh that's right uh, can I ask you like what is all fresh and like you know how did you come across this company and how did it become part of Waycool All Fresh is a company that's focused on direct procurement, post harvest management, and sale of apples and citrus, Indian apples and Indian citrus primarily. This company was formed by a folk, a bunch of folks who are formerly from the railways, and this is a little known fact that uh, Container Corporation of India, which is an Indian railways yeah. uh, entity, set up the first controlled atmosphere storage unit where you can store apples over long periods of time. And this is the team that had actually built that unit, and they were trying to see whether they could experiment with extending the availability of Indian apple, which normally you know disappears by January. 
they've been successful. Today you get Indian apple at least in northern India till May because of controlled atmosphere storage. And, and that's very interesting because you get New Zealand apples, um, European apples, American apples through the year. That's correct. And yet the Indian apples, which are logically the closest and should be easiest to get, are like you said, not available throughout the year. Why is that? Is it See, just the economic incentives? No, it's the agroclimatic conditions. Apple is a temperate crop that grows just above zero degrees Celsius and uh, the influence of snowfall, etc. has a large role to play. That's available only in the northern part of the country and only during this certain period of time. And hence, apples grow uh, uh, only in that particular geography. However, I mean, it's probably news to many, but I discovered this recently that 120 years ago, apple orchards used to be there in Whitefield. Uh, you know, the climate no longer supports the growth of those apple orchards mm. here. Maybe there is a room for experimentation in Coorg or in Uti or Kodai. But today we are restricted in the agroclimatic zones of Himachal, uh, Uttarakhand to some extent and uh, JNK. This also was introduced by somebody who came over from America. So we had our own Johnny Appleseed who brought in apple seeds from America and uh, his name was Stokes and he was the person who enabled the plantation of the first orchards in uh, Himachal and other regions. Otherwise, apple was not native mm. to us. And uh, but, but I, I, Sorry to interrupt you, Karthik, but I hear you that, I mean, perhaps most of the Indian uh, climate is not ideal to grow apples. That's but right. once they're grown and harvested, I mean, as a layperson, I'm like, it is no different than something that was grown and harvested in, That's say, correct. New Zealand or Europe or America. That's correct. So availability, in some senses, can be delinked from uh, sustainability of growing. So why is it that we don't get Indian apples through the year? A few reasons. Number one, you're not growing enough of it. Number two, the amount of uncertainty in climate and physical conditions has become so high that you can't predict the yield anymore. And this year, for example, has been a terrible year for apples. Yeah, I've been reading. I'm told 120 yeah. landslides in Himachal Pradesh. And last and, year, last couple of years also, I think because of overall warming, I've been seeing news of There have been patchy production down. in apples itself. That's number one. Number two. Uh, most of the orchards are only now switching over to the techniques that are followed in the West. There's something called high-density plantation, where you actually plant the trees within a meter of each other. And you prune the trees in a way that the yield per tree is very high. And there are many other techniques that the West uses for mass production of apples. Those are only happening now because it's only now that the old trees have aged and people are replacing with both a different way of plantation as well as different varieties of apples over here. That's the second reason. The third reason is how you uh, do the post-harvest management. Historically, I mean, like I was describing earlier, the first controlled atmosphere storage unit was established in la the late 2000s uh, by Container Corporation of India. It's still there. It's still heavily utilized today. And it took them to come in and demonstrate that this can be done for many others to invest in this space. Even in that, the post-harvest treatment, the kind of uh, inputs that you give, such as uh, so there are certain reagents that you use to fumigate the apples that sort of put the apples to sleep. They stop ethylene from being bonded onto the nodes of the apple, and ethylene is what causes the ripening of the apple. Those chemicals, we took a long time to... Uh, I know, adjust our minds to the fact that they are actually beneficial chemicals and then approve them and to start usage. It's with the usage of those that what's harvested in November is now extendable up to May, which is not bad at all, which is not very far from global standards. Now, the question on how apples are available globally is the follow is answered in the following way, right? Northern Hemisphere is uh, harvests its apples during one half of the year. Southern Hemisphere harvests its apple for the other half of the year. So, New Zealand, etc. will be ha uh, available during... I forgot which one is which half. but I it, got it. That's the way it is done. And that's the reason you get apples throughout the year. So, if they're harvesting for one half of the year, they can extend the shelf life for another four to five months. And consequently, 10 so out of 12 months... So, it becomes like effectively like like a continuous season if you are an apple importer correct you just switch hemispheres correct and for us we have a hard time every july because it's hard to find apples from either hemisphere or from india in july you get the last the dregs of the lot quite literally and the losses are very high and consequently you know our revenues in july will always be struggling because i can't sell apple i can't find them in I the market very so. interesting uh, we were also talking about the concept of branded fruits yes 
uh, it's something which has existed in uh, western markets for a while now yes. for example like you know one of the world's most valuable i think companies like you know dole uh, i mean branded bananas that's correct now do you think that that time has started to arrive in india as well where you might see branded melons branded bananas branded oranges branded apples etc you know if you had asked me this question 2 weeks ago my answer would have been a firm no i have changed my mind and uh, we came in with this hypothesis that fruit will get branded and we have our own brands but heart of hearts i was wondering how long uh, how far away we are from that happening on the ground actually my estimate was that we were about 10 years behind grains cereals and other capabilities but i was pleasantly surprised to find consumers ask for the product by brand in markets like nepal in markets like the northeast especially for all fresh oranges for example more interestingly the dynamic that i'm observing is that the trade wants brands <clears throat> the wholesaler or the distributor over there would rather be seen as a distributor of a unique brand than a trader in apples of a commodity uh, it mm. it helps cement their identity in a market where so many are alike and if the brand is hard to get for the others so if you are appointing somebody as an exclusive distributor they'll work really hard to establish your brand across the geographies and that's I, been our observation i get the trade part right because it's very strongly aligned to economic incentives yes. but what's driving i mean you said you just came back from the northeast and um, north etc what's the consumer sentiment which is driving uh, a demand or a desire to ask for a branded orange consistency in quality because uh, you don't know what's inside the peel when you buy it and the brand communicates to you that what's inside the peel is probably going to be okay uh, that's really what people look for and people get really upset if they op- you know pe- peel open an orange and they find it to be sour or rotten inside people do get upset about it that seems to be the behavior on the ground in fact i've seen uh, customers peel an orange and say hey this is not the right orange i want that and uh, somebody showed me a whatsapp video of it saying this was from bhutan and so on so i think that's is the same thing in any packaged staples uh, uh, offering and so on right consistency in quality nobody is saying you've got to be the best quality can i trust you that i don't have to change my cooking method if i'm using your dal or your rice and it will produce the output consistently and that's what they're looking for and and assuming this works what do you think might be the delta uh, that ex- would exist in a uh and in a pricing premium between an unbranded fruit i mean and you could probably take an example like let's say an orange or a banana and a branded fruit i think uh, it's hard to pinpoint a number because it depends on availability in different also countries. i think different customer segments distribution channels etc but still i mean if you were to put maybe like a range what might it be see it's like this if you are taking an exact like to like product and it's only the way you handle it that makes a difference then you can still get a pricing premium of 5 to 10% on a branded fruit but if you're bringing in a unique variety then you pretty much set the price uh, and that's the big difference that we have seen when you bring in you know in apple you have varieties like pink lady coming in hmm. Uh, hmm. there is a massive resistance NZ of the queen, trade all of these right exactly right. there's usually massive resistance from the trade to go beyond a gala or a delicious somebody's got the guts to bring in one pallet of these I'd, i i, I must interrupt you to say that this is fantastic article which actually like i read many years ago it from the atlantic called the 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 imperfect reign of the red delicious or something yes. and it was the first one that said why the red delicious is such a terrible apple mm-hmm. and it only succeeded because it was bred to have this very luscious looking skin yes. from the outside and it stored very well and it transported well but inside the flesh was mushy so actually it was one of the worst apples to eat but it became very successful because you know it looked good exactly. and it transported very well so exactly. i thought like you know when you mentioned red, and and i think there's a world of difference that exists today that's true red delicious now even at a local namdharis in bangalore is not you know i mean the one which is moving the fastest right many of these varieties that you mentioned are like you know i think moving much faster exactly so if you're bringing in something unique that's different then uh, you can pretty much set price in this market because fruit is uh, an indulgence in many many geographies especially in the south it's an indulgence and consequently people will pay sorry why why do you say it's an indulgence look uh, the, those who want fruit for nutrition and for energy and for sustenance eat bananas 
anything beyond that is something where you're consciously spending more for health or for taste or because your kids will like this better than the other messy fruit that you want them to eat so apples are preferred because of the crunchiness it's, it's, it's not just the sweetness some people like tart apples for example but the crunchiness granny it's smith a, uh, granny yeah, smith yeah. exactly so it's a less messy fruit to have uh, and that's really one of the drivers uh some of these are also driven by the trade for example uh, the northern part of india is now buying bangrapalli in huge quantities keeping quality the product stays hmm. for much longer and the product is a firm product and of course it helps that it's large right so you know you people feel that they're getting more value for money if they buy bangrapalli so there are different uh, behaviors that are driving also this. i mean there's another theory which i have which is the effort that it takes to eat x grams of banana is minimized for larger mango varieties like banganapalli etc uh, because you know you you have to anyway cut and peel right Correct. so smaller mangoes you have to cut and peel 3 4 to arrive that's at true. the same amount of flesh that's true. whereas in a larger banana the effort is just minimized right? that's so true. my guess is for example the north will discover imam pasand very soon oh thank you for very saying soon. that it's very my soon. absolute favorite but uh, is it would i be fair in saying that the imam pasand actually is one of the worst mangoes to transport and the, because its skin is so thin that it bruises That's so right. i actually thought that it would be very hard for imam pasand to become popular beyond south india because unless you are harvesting at a very very early stage it just doesn't like you know keep but this packaging technology available to handle these products now it's just that you know somebody needs to take that bold call saying i'm going to take a risk with one pallet pack it in this material ship it out there and see what happens so it's companies like us you know periodically have that risk taking ability hmm. let me put it that way so when we do uh, that, that we it's, it's great that you do before i move on may i ask you do you have a favorite or favorites mango variety you know what i don't like mangoes that much i'm an <laughs> apple guy through and through okay let me so, ask you the same question for apples what are your favorite apple varieties i like the gala right now mm. and uh, i've liked one the variety called cosmic crisp that was available in the us it's mm. one of the newer varieties no, i don't think it's uh, come uh, to it's india it's not yet, yet come here and uh, i tried it this time when i was uh, visiting my sister and i really liked it it's got that right combination of sweet and tart and the crunchiness is very good so mm. thank you karthik uh I I I wanted to like you know get to discussing way cool and um you know I I I downloaded some information from your site I'm going to read it out as the only full stack tech led supply chain player in India we focus on food cultivation processing and distribution leveraging innovative technology to scale and operate a complex supply chain from fork to farm this is a mouthful can I ask you what does way cool do what is way cool it is a mouthful uh, so let me keep it very simple we are a supply chain company at our heart that's what we do and we believe that with better planning a supply chain can be both efficient and responsive right what we learn in supply chain science is that you either are responding to your customers needs very aggressively at the cost of inventory wastage and operating cost or you are very efficient in all of those but you may not be the most responsive to the customers need this is called the efficiency frontier in supply chain science can you give me an example of how uh, to, this works to give you an example uh, you know if you see uh, a large uh, if you see a startup for example any modern startup they prioritize consumer well being and consumer delight over operating cost in the initial stage so you have a lot of inventory you have a lot of lots uh, of sku lots of products even I, if they get wasted it's fine even if they get wasted it's fine mm. and you have a lot of delivery costs associated with it so you're very responsive but not necessarily the most efficient on the other hand you had you know if you went back to the 70s so many ways if i were to say yeah. that's optimizing for the front end optimizing for the front end Got the it. other is optimizing for operations you know you you had to book a car and it would come when it would come in the earlier days because mm. the production line was optimizing i will do all lx models vx models etc and then you know your car gets allocated in 6 weeks or 8 weeks and so on that was optimized more on efficiency it worked mm. over there because the customer was now by then at that point in time used 
to not having the responsiveness. Got it. You buy what we are able to manufacture and sell. That's correct. We don't necessarily like you know offer you what you may want. Got That's it. Optimizing correct. for the back end. Correct. So the trade off uh, is you know different companies operate at operate at different points. If you're a natural monopoly, if you're in a stable market, it's not growing. You'll operate to the left typically. On the other hand, if you're trying to establish yourself, you're competing aggressively. You'll uh, you'll focus more on responsiveness. But there is a natural frontier on this. What helps push the frontier out is essentially technology. But more than technology is the business process behind the technology. Technology is the tool mm. that helps you deploy a revised way of thinking. So in our case, that's really what we are attempting to do. See, uh, we connect. Uh, the farmer's output with or without processing to a retailer that's essentially the pipe that we are operating now i can buy from the farmer and somehow sell it to the retailer in which case i'm stuck with a product that's dying every minute and therefore losing value every minute on the other hand if i can anticipate what the retailer wants and buy according to what the retailer wants then i can actually avoid that inventory sitting on my books and perishing all the time and i can continually make this you know faster and faster and faster so that my uh, velocity throughput through my fixed assets which are my warehouses etc goes up and scale goes up through my uh, various assets that i'm operating and therefore again operating efficiency now what this requires is our ability to predict what the retailer will order <laughs> so i mean before we move on to that what kind of products commodities you said you're a supply chain company that's correct. you said you're farm to fork that's correct within that are there areas are there like you know uh, commodities areas product categories that you operate in and that you don't yes there are uh, for example we deal with fresh produce grains and staples and milk Uh, these are the only three categories that we operate in we don't operate in meats because we realize that there is no synergy in the supply chain uh, your source is different your uh, warehouses per se have to be different because you have cross contamination risk and the customer is also different because the customers that uh, other than a few modern retailers meat uh, shops are dedicated meat shops and so so we said we will not get into that space even within these categories we operate at different levels of depth for different commodities for vegetables i go all the way to the farmer i have my own collection centers for uh, fruit for domestic fruit we are progressively building capability to go to the farmer so we are very good in apple and citrus we are starting to get there on pomegranate and uh, uh, to some extent banana we have started the we are able to do the tamil directly nadu bananas directly sourced from, from the farmers. farmers that's correct otherwise i'm assuming that you're sourcing from, from some kind of an aggregator so okay, it will be a, it could be a farmer producer organization or it could be an aggregator got it uh, or it could be a trader hmm. so or it could be from the local mandi in your city so those are the various levels today in vegetables only scale determines where i buy from the farm because i need a minimum scale to buy a farmer versus where i buy from the mandi so i think about 40 skus now we are able to procure regularly from the uh, collection centers there are another 20 25 skus that we'll buy from the mandi but they are very small quantities in case of grains we are very good in lentils uh, lentils are peculiar in india because uh, it's partially grown within the country and partially imported so you need a by you know supply chain that's capable of handling both so we do import we don't import from growers we import from traders but the domestic market we buy from fpos as well as individual farmers we have collection centers in maharashtra and northern karnataka from where we procure and uh, what we procure we process up to different stages so we have in fact for lentils i have my own mill in southern uh, tamil nadu so we process the lentils over there and as well as other uh, co-packers we sell it in bulk we sell it in white label and we sell it in our own brands all three we do because i get the scale economies of buying by doing right. that and then there's milk as well you uh, see milk is uh, again uh, 35% direct farm procurement and 65% from aggregators uh, other startups and aggregators who are into milk aggregation the only thing that's limiting me over there is i need to put in some capex and right now i'm sort of going slow on the capex so we need to set up bulk milk chillers rapid milk coolers as well as milk collection points so i have about 30 milk collection points and two bmcs right now i need to set up nine more bmcs in about 100 and odd milk collection points good thank you for that uh, karthik uh one of the things that you say you've said in the past is that india's agro industry to which you belong is largely push based but vehicle was designed to be pull based yes uh what does that mean so uh today if you are a retailer 
the way you decide what to buy is by looking at your stock at the end of the day using your judgment on what tomorrow is going to be like and deciding therefore how many quantities of what i will buy you either go to the mandi or nowadays because there are a plethora of options like us you open up different apps or call up different people and say i need so many kgs the challenge is that that product has already been harvested the day before and i don't have the intrinsic efficiency of a market a market is a natural liquidation point which will always be more efficient at scale because it has the scale and it sells all kind of uh, vegetables the only other option for an organized player like me is to be able to predict what you will order a day in advance and sometimes much more in advance depending upon the harvest distance and so on so within this we have storable and non storable commodities uh you take the greens as well as the what we call as the six seas you know carrot cabbage cauliflower etc as well as the native indian vegetables these are not storable it is best if you move them as fast as possible from the farm gate to the retail point here's where we focused on improving our ability to forecast our own demand now uh, for example uh, we started off with a simple you know 12 week time series saying 12 mondays will determine this monday's demand then we learned that hey it's not that simple if there is a long weekend the behavior changes drastically if there's a festival the behavior changes drastically over time we were initially learning this manually but now we have a data science team that is actually using uh, ai and other tools to continually learn and improve the forecasting accuracy so today we have reached 83% forecasting accuracy on these 25 skus that are highly sensitive that i'm buying what, from what does a f- when you say 83% forecasting efficiency what does that mean so i will be plus minus uh, uh, you know the worst i can get to is 83 minus 3 sigma which will be about uh, say 70% the best i can get to is about 95% so uh, that is what we mean by forecasting accuracy and now the team is monitoring the sigma how much is that deviation mm-hmm. in this and with more data the more insights it gets more and more accurate and more consistent buying from my customers it gets more and more accurate so so when you say that you are um, designing yourself to be pull based what you're really saying is that we are trying to build a better forecasting model exactly uh, rather than trying to push what we have already um, acquired to the market because it's a perishable commodity and we need to get it that's correct okay. so this is part 1 of what we do part 2 is based on this forecast how do i buy hmm. you know you typically buy closer to the lower limit of your forecast and then top up from the market so that you are able to have just the right amount of stock so that you're not stuck with so that you're not stuck with stock we're getting better and better at it now and uh, that's what's keeping our waste low in this right is it true that you're named way cool because you and your co-founder sanjay had originally hypothesized that cold chains will solve the supply chain yes. problem but subsequently you realized no not really but the name stuck yes that's absolutely true uh, you know we actually looked at this segment the way we got in into this itself was interesting right we started off i am an automotive guy who was selling commercial vehicles for a living earlier logistics was my customer and cold logistics had taken off so when we double clicked into what the cold logistics folks were doing we realized that they went to pharmaceuticals and various kinds of food and that's when you were getting a lot of reports saying cold storage is the solution to india's problems and so on and therefore we said maybe we should deep uh, deep dive into this and we said let's understand this so it was called project way cool and when we got into it we realized that there was a lot we had to unlearn and a lot of reports that we had to forget i think the in- indians are intrinsically more efficient and therefore we figured out quite some time back that it is better for me to harvest and consume the same day and move material as fast as possible rather than put it in a cold store then maintain it all along and take it out secondly the challenge in cold storage is that unless the entire chain is at the operating at the same temperature the product dies even faster you it suffers a thermal shock and then it actually dies much faster that's true because sometimes you can see that like you know in stores if the power, the electricity goes off for a while and if, it, if the fruit or the produce has not you can make out when it's lost that refrigeration exactly. for 6 hours or so suddenly its character just changes it changes like you exactly so uh, and thirdly all of these solutions are temperate country solutions 45 degrees celsius in hyderabad and i'm moving it from somewhere in the north where it's passing through even hotter temperatures and the sheer inefficiency of it was appalling 
so we said that you know we should treat and this as a supply chain and the energy cost the energy cost exactly the differential to maintain it at a lower yeah exactly so our view was that we should look at this as a supply chain problem and not as a cold chain problem cold chain problem is a cold chain is the hammer and so everything looks like a nail that's not the right way to do it right what what are you solving for and what is the right uh, tool for that uh, problem how long did it take you and took us six to, to seven months at this understanding that look it's not just about cold chain it was six to seven months it was high time work right we weekends we used to go understand how this works and uh, the market educated us they said uh, you know if uh, market was very straightforward right? they said boss we've been in this business for centuries if not millennia if that were a solution we would have implemented it no we didn't so it doesn't uh, work for us kathi you say something very important right like you know and and so sometimes what you say is true like you know so when you're looking at something new and disruptive that hasn't tried before or perhaps has been tried before and failed you you know faced with this look if this had to work somebody would have already done it right at the same time there are numerous examples in india and outside of someone still decided to do it and it succeeded yes so how do you differentiate between you know as a leader and as a ceo between when someone says that look if this had to happen it would have happened that's not always true versus in some cases you know you are right like you know there is a reason why it's like that so how do you tend to kind of uh, interrogate those confusing decision points i think we use uh, i personally use two sets of uh, insights one of which i am good at and the other one i am trying to learn one is is there a better toolkit available uh, that that will answer whether it is technically feasible to do something which was not feasible 10 years ago the second is is your consumer evolving to a point where your consumer will accept your solution which is something that i am learning now and that's one of the reasons why i am in so many field visits as well and the consumer has positively surprised me this time they may negatively surprise me the next time my view is that changing consumer behavior is too expensive and fraught with limited probabilities of success but if you know that you know two years hence the consumer will be at this point so let me start preparing the ground then uh, i believe you will arrive at which is workable and which is not workable is there an example at way cool where something is taking off now and you started the groundwork for that 2 years ago branded staples mm. i think uh, branded staples was something where i faced a lot of pushback early as well uh, from your be- team uh, from external uh, stakeholders from my team even from some industry what was the pushback there's already so much of it in india are bharat mein sab log bag kaat ke loose mein bechte hain ha that was the thesis that's that's one end of the spectrum at the other end there's already a lot of branded staples from the big brands etc in stores right which aren't necessarily doing their best right i mean ah, okay. you have a lot of big fmcg companies i think ashirwad has broken through mm-hmm. but quite a few brands aren't really doing their best you find sons of the soil local packers as well as regional players who are doing better than any of these and they are you know there is a difference between a label and a brand these guys are labelers and mm. not so much as branders so that was the uh, uh, pushback that we were uh, uh, receiving consistently i saw three or four things change in the market and frankly i discovered this from the market itself right uh, when we were sending our first bags of rice to retailers we were basically sending it unbranded and uh, the miller used to pack it in whatever he had at that time so the color of the bag changed and suddenly the sales returns started increasing from retailers so we were trying to figure out what's going on and we went and uh, spoke to the retailers they said nahi nahi orange bag hi chahiye mere ko that customer liked that product this is some other product you have given me and that is when we said that okay maybe the customer is looking at the orange bag as a proxy for the brand that was one observation that we had the second is you know the sales people will always come back at you and say your price is too high so we said let's go to the arisi mandi which is the typical rice shop and understand what kind of uh, uh, you know buying behavior is there from the consumer over there we observed a few things see there are some sons of the soil brands which have become big in every geography there's one brand in andhra i don't want to name them specifically mm, sure. there's one brand which is very popular in parts of chennai one which is very popular in coastal andhra these are all you know labels that have become brands and uh, that gave me the second uh, insight that you know the consumer is using that handle as a you know cross check for quality consistency the third insight that we got was that she was not buying the cheapest product 
she had her own views on each product category and you know we found lot of people buying the second or third most expensive rice it seemed to us that the most expensive rice was uh, you know biting your uh, hand a bit and the cheapest one was seen as a proxy for poor quality so they were choosing all the intermediary layers so that said okay not only is there a brand as a source of comfort on product consistency but also maybe the consumer is looking at it as a proxy for quality and they have different expectations on quality that is really when we started we'll test it out so the consumer behavior seemed to be gravitating the second thing that we observed was that uh, you know uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, regional brands that had come up in specific categories like oil and dal uh, you know uh, there are brands like udayam which have been around for a long time in uh, dal brands like gold winner in oil so oil and dal are again commodity similar to rice and products like that so why can't we brand it the third insight was when we looked at uh, the north where basmati in the last 20 years has been completely branded So certain basmati can be branded why can't non basmati be branded so these were a few uh, triggers that things were changing on the uh, customer overall side. it's an inexorable trend right the premiumization yes. of i think things that were unbranded or commoditized is like you know it happens at its own pace but it's it's virtually in, i don't think in every single category it happens it happens but the challenge there rohan was that i was fighting the tide when there were a large number of folks coming in and discounting to get into the retail outlet uh, the large number of big platforms mm, etc mm. that were coming in and using uh, pricing as a way of gaining traction in the market uh, we had the cash and carry guys we had the online players etc coming in so this was not a popular opinion at that point in time but uh, our instinct told us that this will work and it has taken off handsomely today there are many other companies coming in and starting to brand this category so we have now started to move on to the next thing in premiumization and so on but that's the can I ask you a few questions about way cool i mean when did you start when did you and sanjay start way cool we started way cool in july 2015 and we actually started it as a farm to consumer platform uh subsequently we pivoted to b2b because we realized that non linearity was not possible and the scaling will take too long in mm. farm to consumer and how how big is way cool we do about 150 crores of revenue every month and uh, that's about 1500 to 2000 tons of food moving through our system every day and the organization how many people are there in the we have about 2000 people in the organization today your chennai headquartered we are headquartered in chennai and we service all of south, south southern india you are a venture funded company can i ask you how much venture capital you've raised and what your last valuation was we've raised a total of 180 million dollars so far and uh, our last valuation if i remember was 700 odd million dollars uh, all right thank you for that um you've also launched a saas tech company that's correct where you've you know i think taken solutions that you've built for yourself that's correct and productize it and are selling i think it's called sensa that's correct where did that insight come about and and why did you not look at that like i mean as an outsider what if i told you hey this is not core to you you should not be in the market to be selling software you're essentially an agri tech player but yet you did it so can you tell us why you did it So at the risk of sounding a little arrogant i mean would you tell amazon they shouldn't do aws <laughs> right i'm not saying no. that i'm amazon with the benefit right. of hindsight we wouldn't but i'm sure there would be many people sure back then when they launched who would have said that you should not be getting into that area See, but we, well pointed out you know we initially bought our technology we went with ready made off the shelf saas solutions then we realized that given that we are end to end i'm i'm not just solving the last mile problem so i can't manage with just four applications i needed more i am in multiple categories i have a view on how the product should be handled so i had a suite of applications just for quality traceability and things like that and we weren't getting good solutions from the market and we weren't getting uh, people willing to customize them so we set up a small tech team initially purely with the intent of setting up a distribution management system then we realized that we had to automate our warehouses because uh, strangely enough for the world's most populous country it's so hard to get labor so we said we should automate our warehouses so we set up uh, we built a suite of solutions which we call sensa depot today then procurement had to be automated because you had to remove discretion from procurement so you need some independent benchmarking tools you need a reverse auction platform a bunch of other tools so we created sensor source 
And as we engage with the farmers, we now have a program called Outgrow, which goes pretty deep, which I'll talk about later. And we have a farm management solution as well through that. So all of these were built. In fact, they were built virtually. Uh, when we started this team, Avinash started it in Bangalore in Indiranagar with 20 people. We are sitting in Indiranagar. I know, right I know now. your office. I've been to your office. I've seen the, the cute Sorry, dog. Sorry, my bad. We are sitting in Korumangla right now yeah. at Studio Sugar Line. But our office, uh, right. the Ken's office is in Indiranagar. Yeah, we were not very far from your office there. Oh, so, we must visit you. And uh, that team was built virtually. And they in turn built these applications virtually. They first met in January 2022 after all the lockdowns had ceased. And that was a remarkable push that the team had done, which gave me confidence that we're on to something. Subsequently, we also integrated all our suite into SAP S4 HANA. And uh, the, there, the team demonstrated us, you know, the ability to integrate the companies that we have invested into, into SAP S4 HANA very quickly. We rolled out SAP in uh, uh, an SV Agree in 21 days. In all fresh, we rolled it out in 30 days. And it is perfectly smooth. So that gave me the confidence that... You Normally, know, it's like, you know, I mean, SAP rollouts, at least from what I remember, is something that takes months and months, sometimes even multiple years. Correct. Like, you know, and it takes out. years to settle down and yeah. so on. So this was very quick. And so we said the team's intrinsics are very strong. The tools are working for us. What do I lose by offering this to the rest of the world? Now, I can't be... One of the other lessons that I had learned is that I have to be geographically focused in the physical business. This is an operations business. Uh, you can't... I can't start something in Bangalore and then go to NCR. It's like setting up another vehicle. So I'm never going to exceed this geographic footprint. But I believe I have something to say. I believe that our technology has uh, a solution for a problem that's applicable universally. So why not offer it for others? That was the thing. The cost is sunk. We uh, At most, we had a few salespeople. And then we see if we can monetize it. That's really how this started. And off. how has that panned out? We have six clients. And uh, we're, we have a pipeline of about 20 odd clients right now. Most clients start with one of the LMA modules. And now most of them have started looking at the full suite as well. These are clients both within India as well as outside India. Typically, any FMCG company that's operating in commodities like us finds, us, finds our toolkit useful. I'm curious, do you also, is there a strategic benefit, did you, I'm sure you thought of this, of when other people use your software, of course they're paying you money, so that's revenue, but they're also using it and giving you feedback on additional features, etc. Of course. Which could be useful for you itself, it's yes. valuable insight as well. Has yes. that started to happen yes. as well? Yes, in fact, the next upgrade of Sensor Compass that we're releasing has far more features than what Waku asks for. And that's basically because, you know, five customers are using it and saying, I want all of these in my solution. See, they find benefit because we are practitioners who have built this tool. We're not a pure tech team that has built this tool. So we've been through real life challenges. For example, in Sensor Depot, there is a module that factors in the moisture loss of every vegetable per hour. Because uh, what and this is, is sent, drawing information from sensors. Uh, so no, this is actually physically oh, measuring. So once you've okay, okay, got exactly. it. Exactly, physically measuring sent weight versus received weight. Because otherwise, you know, you just use any ERP system. It's going to go haywire on inventory. Because uh, oh, because you acquired let's say hundred kilos and, and it's only it's, ninety-eight by the time it reaches. Okay. And many of these are not rigged to capture that. So those kind of insights we have learnt as practitioners, and we are building into this. There is this concept called overages in vegetable packing. Right? Mm. Uh, a vegetable is an irregular shaped item. So if it's one kg, you'll either pack nine hundred grams or one point one kg, both of which cause dissatisfaction. Uh, your if your client is an online player and you packed 1.1 kg, they lose money. If it's 900 kg, I lose money. Or the customer is unhappy, saying you cheated me of this. So how do you solve for overages? How do you account for overages and underages? How do you correct your inventory or real time based on that? All of those we have learnt over time, and uh, that is what gives comfort to the other side, saying okay, these guys know the industry and they build technology to suit the industry. And what happens for us is they teach us 10 more things and the tools get better and better as we go forward. And you're and using those benefits. same tools. So it's exactly. like flowing back into your business operations as well. Exactly. Not just into mine, but every other client's Everyone business answers, operation yeah. becomes more efficient. Interesting. Um, Karthik, I want to switch to talking about, I, I, I think you've given us a great overview of Way Cool. I want to switch to some conversations about you as a leader and as a founder. 
um things about decision making feedback loops etc right uh but i i i i want to start by referencing something that you said while we were like just getting ready for the sh- um, show and you said that look you've been traveling in the northeast and north and then now you're going somewhere else after this and you said that's my job and at that point i wanted to ask you you're the co-founder and ceo and you told me my job is to be traveling into the field why is that what do you see um, as your job as way cool and as you and why is being on the field your job the the job of a leader is to take decisions that uh, uh, are based on facts now facts are qualitative and quantitative uh, if you are sitting in your office and reading off spreadsheets or your various apps you get quantitative information you don't get the qualitative radar and my job is to see around the corner and uh, this is applicable for uh, my customers my partners and my employees you know the i have a huge problem with the org chart being shown how it is right and i've been vocal what about that, what does that mean and you show the managing oh, the, director okay, on top right, and like you have the pyramid a pyramid kind of structure right like it in a branching it should be the out. other way right your sales people are out there on top yeah, the mm. guys who are running your warehouse are supporting the sales people are immediately after mm. then you bring in the cluster heads the cluster heads job mm. is to provide a guardrail and to support your sales person your mm. regional heads job is to support the cluster head your business unit head has to support all these guys and i am the ultimate uh, sumai tangi as we call it in Ch- in tamil right what does that mean i am the, the load bearer for oh, the entire okay, organization that is how it should be hmm. what that means is that the organization for it to be agile and responsive has to shape itself around what's happening out there and how your people are forced to respond to it otherwise it's a prescribe. fascinating analogy I, i must tell you right and otherwise we prescribe uh, what needs to be done and uh, that causes a lot of frustration chaos and angst in the front lines we go through these periods once in a while it's not, i mean we are nowhere near perfect so whenever i sense that we are going through one such period i am out in the field learning that's really uh, what follows because i can imagine that you know i mean you you seem to be saying that we go through these periods and i can visualize it in 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 the course of the lifetime of an organization there are ups and downs yes. right like yes the structure is working right now and then you start to feel that no something is fraying at the edges i need to go and figure it out yes. and you go and figure it out then when you come back what happens do you end up then altering the structure yes we have to uh, altering structure altering policies altering processes to give you an example some of the uh, distribution partners that are further out we realize that uh, you know the credit limit that we set for them means that they have to get a truck of material liquidate it and pay us before we send the next truck which means there's a discontinuity in product availability in the market that discontinuity is exploited by their neighboring trader so if you set your credit limit to be two trucks because it takes a week for a truck to go from the south to wherever they are and a week for them to liquidate the truck and pay us then uh, we've solved for product being available all the time in that market so we just reset our credit limits accordingly and two trucks is not as big a risk as 20 trucks right so that was one in small insight that we learned so the processes and structures have to undergo corrections based on the feedback from the market now naturally there should be a pushback from those who are mandated with safeguarding so there should be a challenge from my finance team and there is uh, saying you know are you taking too much risk what if the guy says okay you've been doing in say coconuts where your value is small and suddenly he wants to do apple and therefore two trucks of apple suddenly becomes 50 lakhs do i increase the credit limit to that no then you come out with another solution saying hey maybe there is a cold storage in that town and i put my guy in that town and store inventory over there to make sure that the inventory is available but still it's on my books and rather than going to a customer and therefore you know getting diffused into the market as a leader i get the sense that you're constantly learning and trying to understand what's happening do you like what are your if i were to ask you a question about what are your learning methods how do you keep abreast of everything that you need to as a ceo see i i i am i find it easier to learn by observation than by reading i just don't have as much time to read anymore and observation convinces me observation makes sure that i understand nuance a lot better otherwise reading tends to put things in one and zero so i learn best when i'm out there traveling and i also learn from a different set of entrepreneurs than we those that we normally look up to i 
look up to a lot of strong regional entrepreneurs because they don't have the luxury that i had i mean even i am a regional entrepreneur in some sense i am not in bangalore or ncr so we are at the periphery of the startup ecosystem if you will but there are people who have been even more peripheral they have bootstrapped and they have built phenomenal industries and i observe them a lot to understand what they have done for example satish in milky mist he is a seriously solid entrepreneur because he is selling paneer in tamil nadu and you refused to sell milk while buying milk imagine the resistance he would have faced people would have been laughing at him uh, when he started off but milky mist is a phenomenal brand and they've established themselves i learn a lot from i learned a lot from folks like kevin care i learned from hatson i feel that there is a lot to offer over there uh, which is not documented well enough and also and consequently i learn by observation i get if i get the chance i go and visit some of these factories i see how they run their factories when you so, when you're out in the field and you're meeting people etc and and you come across interesting observation like do you have a method of documenting capturing it or is it largely in your so what head? we've done is we've started uh, so we all of us are on gchat groups in the company and we have one called waycool.all which where every employee is there saturdays and sundays i try and capture some of these and put down saying this is what i learned and uh, people find it helpful uh, it's not the most efficient medium because pe- people are so busy that they occasionally read yeah. and the structure of gchat is limiting but that's the platform that we are using we've also tried master classes and uh, that did well during covid where we can get folks to come down and have a virtual master class and it's recorded and made available and so on but what we are now starting to do is to actually build a proper knowledge management system where we actually document all of this and make sure it is stored in the organization irrespective of who is there and who is not there and that's really what we'll do going forward uh continuing on the same question i mean it's it's very clear that feedback loops are very important to you because you're constantly out in the market you're trying to understand right within the organization do you have any method of soliciting and cultivating feedback loops it's getting more and more formalized and i find that you know uh, interestingly enough the more formalized feedback loops you have the more the informal channels work better so uh, the formal channels are there you have your standard uh, you know ma- mailboxes for any feedback grievance platforms town halls and all of the those are in place but after this meeting i'm going to hang out with the guys who run one of the warehouses in bangalore that's where i get my feedback from the ground and uh, that's what i pump into the rest of the organization as well as is actions. is giving and receiving feedback well one of the things that uh, is important at way cool is important but not practiced well enough i think we have good improvement room over there i think uh, the challenge is that look i was in mckinsey where this was a way of life it's not easy for folks who have been in corporate life and professional life to take feedback and sometimes it's not uh, they don't give good feedback either and uh, the nature of our industry is such that most of the folks are veterans i mean we we have relatively fewer folks who have come in fresh and uh, therefore the diversity of the talent and their relative experiences are very different so i will say that we have some ground to cover over there but it becomes necessary it's uh, any company this is necessary so that you are developing your own talent and uh, making sure corrections happen fast okay. do you have i mean this podcast is called first principles and so uh, a, a significant part of what we try to understand and uncover is mental models of leaders are there mental models that you find yourself turning to frequently when it comes to significant decision making etc at way cool i I'm, i'm not sure what you mean by the definition of a mental model but there are i believe a few uh, you know axioms which uh, we should live with one is any solution that we build also has to be in tune with its environment rather than you know i don't like the word disruptive let me put it that way i think the word disruptive reminds me of an american interstate highway whereas i prefer back country roads uh, in- are you a systems thinking fan because you have an automotive background as well because in systems thinking you design and implement new solutions which must fit into an existing system 
and continue to perform as an overall system as well yeah i think uh, i wouldn't call myself a fan but i think that's the only way in which uh, operations can be made successful i have a lot of system thinking fan in the company too and they the guys <laughs> I mean, are yeah, really yeah. Man- if you're strong in manufacturing every one of thing, them yeah. is uh, thinking that way we get we fight a lot saying you know your solution is fine but it is not replicable and scalable all those debates happen extensively and that's helping the company for sure but i genuinely believe that you know i mean i am a reader of history you you know i typically read a lot and i don't like the history of kings and queens and all that that's hagiography of the victorious i rather prefer reading about common people how civilizations lived and so on i think i have observed that there is a riverine view of life and a desert view of life the riverine view is that humans exist at the pleasure of nature the desert views that nature exists for the ple- ple- pleasure of humans because they've been brought up in scarcity whereas you've been brought up in plenty i think the riverine view is the right view and uh, what that means is that you sway with the wind you sway with the landscape and you build a model that has the flexibility to sway with the landscape nowhere is it more true than india that's the reason i said i will not go to the north i have to build a different model for that geography it's almost like building a separate it's organization it's building a second way cool and if mm. i go to the east it's a third way why cool. why is that like see the the, the factors the, the way people buy the way people transact the way people build relationships and what they cultivate what they eat everything is different you these are all locally sourced items except for a few so i have to build an all new supply chain i have to transplant people from here who will run that because if i am hiring professionals they will build their own company and then in imposing through technology governance systems etc works in a very limited manner in india so uh, forever you will have people flying from chennai to delhi trying to manage that business it will not work we experimented this a little with the west and even in the west we got stuck a bit our cost soared and we weren't able to align that the processes there with the rest of the company and therefore we said no we understand the south well i know the consumer i know the partner i know how to collect money and i know where to buy to feed the south i know what uh, will work here so i am quite comfortable operating in this geography so uh, within the south also it varies literally by pin code behaviors vary by pin code you can't obviously have a new business model for every pin code but we have built enough flex into this model for example our distributed model in kerala is slightly different from what it is in tamil nadu which is slightly different from what it is in karnataka so uh, those flexibilities we have been able to incorporate and uh, i think that is one core principle that i believe in and the second principle that i believe in is that uh, you know there will be significant gear shifts in the way indians buy any commodity or any product over the next 5 to 20 years and we have to be in sync with those gear shifts that happen one example is what we discussed about branded fruit it was a big surprise to me uh, there will be other such examples that come in ready to cook will take off especially in the south where you have more dual income families it will take off maybe not the way it did in the west but it will take off simple uh, problem that most people face you forgotten to soak your chana and you need to make chana in the afternoon what do you do you buy a retorted pre soaked chana pack the product is available the time for that product has started to come and so those kind of shifts will happen in india consumers so will be tough to money. run i mean as a business then you're you're obviously like you know serving the present market or the let's say horizon 1 market is what brings in the revenue and like you know keeps your organization at the same time you got to keep thinking about stuff that is happening in 3 years or 5 years yes which is still nascent yes. but it's not going to lead like some of those bets may go wrong etc yes. so i mean how do you look at it as a leader and decide where to place those bets see i used to do this myself but now we're starting to form a consumer insights team which is differently wired than us right you have somebody with a more sociological background a social psychologist that's the kind of team that i'm starting to build we'll be ready with the team by the april or so whose only job is to go out there and figure out what's going to happen and what's really you know you ask me about my mental model what is the mental model of my consumer and how mm, is it shifting mm. and therefore am i getting prepared for it and that insight starts feeding my new product development and so on and that's necessary 
The third is that I don't believe in rural versus urban divide. I believe that there is an India 1A and India 1B, India 2 and India 3, which is uniformly spread. And potentially we may have even more uh, loyal customers outside the big cities than we do in the big cities. And there's nowhere is this true more than in the south. And therefore, any model should not restrict itself to an urban lens. And I find that many models today are saying, okay, I'm solving for 10 minute delivery convenience or 30 minute delivery in a big city. That may not be the problem for them, but uh, in a small town, but they have a different problem, which is similar to a problem that somebody in the big city faces. And your, if your model can solve for those, then the loyalty there is far higher than it is in the big cities as well. So this is something that I have learned. Why, I mean, is, that, why is the loyalty higher? Is it merely a function of less competition or is there something inherently different? that? There are two or three things that happen, right? One is, the firstly, the, um, uh, the discretionary spending opportunities in smaller towns are lower. So they'd rather spend their money on you. Number two, uh, it you become a source of differentiation for them. Just like I said, the small mm -hmm. trader over there becomes a distributor of my brand. And they are different in their little world over there. And uh, the third is that, uh, uh, you know, the your product availability is definitely better in an environment where they're starved of those products. So competition, lack of competition is definitely a reason. I mean, I mean there, are, there was a very, all these prestigious coffee chains are go-to places in the small towns. Here you find them in every street corner, but they're really a go-to place in the small town. And people can spend that kind of money in those small towns. So that is, I think, uh, third uh, firm view that I have. Lastly, I think, connected to the first point, I believe we should tread lightly. And this is, you know, companies should have purposes. Companies should not just be there uh, to, uh, to satisfy one or two stakeholders. If you're only satisfying the customer by saying, hey, I'm giving you good products, that's fine. You're a good company, but in my view, you're not a great company. If you're only satisfying the shareholder with giving better returns, good company, not a great company. If you have a purpose and you're getting closer and closer to fulfilling the purpose, it will be asymptotic, but you will eventually get there. Uh, then you're a great company. And that is what my is your view. purpose? My purpose is to make sure that this supply chain that we have started building out is self-propelling, self-sustaining, and is resilient to all kinds of changes. You're describing a system. <laughs> That's honestly yeah it, right? resilience and like but yeah I mean I, I get it because mm -hmm. we are going to go through a period of serious volatility. Uh, Why do you say that? See, the first sixty years we solved our food uh, sourcing problem. We were living ship to mouth, and what uh, Dr. Swaminathan and others did imported is imported product. By that you mean imported exactly. pulses, imported and import, pulses. Yeah. What Dr. Swaminathan, uh, CS, and others did was uh, original green revolution. Original yeah. green revolution. Now we are solving for the supply chain to make sure what's produced reaches the consumer. You're going to go through climatic shifts. If we can argue endlessly as to the source of that shift, but 1.5 degrees Celsius is unavoidable increase. I've seen a model somewhere in Europe, uh, in a university, they showed me this model of what happens at a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase, a 3 degree increase and a 4 degree increase. At 1.5 Celsius, many countries can't produce food. And countries like India become food sources, not just for themselves, but for others as well. At 3 degrees Celsius, the primary region that will still be capable of producing food is 100 kilometers radius from where we are sitting. Vast parts of the Deccan Plateau become desertified. That's the serious problem that we're facing. And at 4 degrees Celsius, we are all literally and figuratively toast. <laughs> That's the reality. So uh, that is going to be the next big problem that we are going to have to tackle. My view is that we didn't cause this problem, but we are going to be the, one of the bigger victims of this problem. Given that you can't change, I mean, I can't go and dictate to another country, you reduce your emissions. We've seen how gridlocked those conversations are. I have to both ad mitigate and adapt. I My people have to develop and therefore any uh, developmental agenda that I drive in this country has to be by nature mitigative. At the same time, I have to adapt because others are not going to listen to me. I have to make sure I survive in this environment. If temperatures go by 3 degrees, the, what we need is seed research that is producing seeds that are climate resilient. I need to preserve this, the biggest asset that we have, which is our soil. 
India has the most arable land in the world. We have phenomenal soil. We have to preserve that soil. Those actions have to be taken. And that's really what I meant by saying that the company should have a purpose. And this should be the purpose when you make a sensitive, you know, sustainable and resilient. And, and you also chain. use the phrase, uh, company should tread lightly. What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, if I'm doing all of this and I'm basically creating further uh, climate change. Did you mean ecological footprint? Ecological okay. footprint. I think we should tread lightly. So, uh, food miles reduction is a good example. Uh, I mean, in that sense, if I were to circle back to that thing about uh, Indian apples versus, let's say, New Zealand apples, etc., that would be an example of treading lightly because it's Correct. much more ecologically conscious to consume Indian apples than Correct. it is to consume New Zealand apples or American apples. To give you an example, there is a variety of apple now that they have successfully tested at 40 degrees Celsius and it grows. It's still not the best looking apple. So some more hybridization may be required. If we are able to crack that, then you grow apple in South. South is the largest market for apples, but we're importing all our apples over 13,000 miles. If you're able to grow it somewhere in the South, then you've deflated food miles drastically. And uh, that's value creating for everybody. It's also the more sustainable way to do this. Thank you, Karthik. Uh, you've studied engineering and then you did your MBA do you want to like you know tell us like you know what's your how did you end up um, co-founding uh, way cool I mean what's your I mean where do you grow up where do you study and then and what what was this career lattice I mean I, I tend to look at careers as sort of like a snake and ladders game I don't mean that snakes literally but it's like Sometimes it takes you laterally, sometimes it takes you up, sometimes it brings you down. But ultimately, to, to go back to your point about way cool, it's like, you know, I mean, there is a lot of alternate movement, but you end up getting to a destination in very interesting ways. What has been your uh, path to yeah, co-founding? I, I wouldn't cool? call it a very exciting path per se, because it's a very templatized path that most of us go through engineering and then... I did a master's in engineering abroad, but I've always made a series, uh, what's perceived from the outside to be a series of odd choices. Uh, what was your very first job? My very first job was in Tata Motors. So I graduated out of my, uh, I did my master's at Purdue, came back to India and then go join Tata Motors, which many considered an odd choice. In fact, in some of my interviews in India, I was asked, did you have a visa problem? Did you have a health problem? Why did you come back? I said, I never intended to stay, so uh, I kept my word. I finished my master's and I came back. And the next questions they used to ask was, do you, are you aware that you will not get any special treatment because you came from abroad? I said, I'm not asking for special <laughs> treatment. I just want a job. So the reason I joined Tata Motors was that this was when the Indica was being built and I desperately wanted to be part of that project. One thing which provokes me is when people say something can't be done. I have to be part of something that, a part of that to show that it can. At that time, there was a lot of skepticism about passenger cars being built in India and so on. So if I'm part of a small part of that journey, I'll feel satisfaction. And it was a very satisfying experience. I think we went through a very challenging period, but I learned a lot. That's really where my whole thesis of being out there in the field, observing and working with my hands took off. Most of the problems we had to do DOE, we had to cut open doors and, you know, re-engineer those doors physically and so on. That gave me some confidence that this can be done. My next job was with a company. How long were you with? I was there for two years. And immediately after, I was approached by a company called Timken, which... Uh, didn't weren't there, there wasn't there a JV between Tata and Timken? Tata there was. Timken? It had just yeah. been uh, uh, taken over by uh, Timken totally and became Timken India. They wanted to set up an R and D center in Bangalore. These were the days when we were known for Y two K and not R and D. Therefore, I said this looks interesting, and was joined as part of the initial team that set up that center. And I was with them for three and a half years. A lot of learnings and insights over there. For example, the whole what's now called frugal engineering or Jugaad sometimes played itself out beautifully in that job. Uh, about 100 meters from here used to be a small machine shop where we built a part for 4,000 rupees that we were otherwise importing for $4,000. That's when we learned about how engi Indian frugal engineering works. And... Uh, uh, we, I think that center is still doing pretty well. It's an electronic city now and it's doing well. 
One of my jobs over there is to actually build the office. I mean, we bought a six-acre plot and we built our office. And there, uh, I got into a lot of uh, challenges where, how do you take decisions? You know, there was a big debate on whether you should use uh, centralized air conditioning versus a number of split air conditioning. How do you take the decisions? And one of my managers said, have you heard of NPV? Can you work out the NPV of these two? And which is NPV positive is what we will pick. You know, those are the kind of, I said, I haven't heard of NPV. So he taught me. Net present value. Exactly. Yeah. And then uh, when some other decision had to be taken, he used to draw a two by two chart and said, here is how you think about this. That fascinated me. So I'm one of those specimens who actually went and did an MBA to learn something and not so to get the Did next. you do your MBA after Timkin? After Timkin. So mm. I applied to ISB because it was a shorter program. And uh, I learned a lot over there. Uh, I mean, when you're an engineer, your worldview is very, very restricted. And ISB was interesting because you had a very diverse batch with experience. Peer learning was phenomenal. And of course, the faculty were very good. Post that, it was campus placement. I was again debating because I had a job back in the automotive industry. But people told me that, you know, you won't get the shot again. You can always go back into the industry, take it. It's going to be accelerated learning for you. So I abided by my friend's advice, which I haven't done historically. But I think that was good advice. Where did you join? I joined McKinsey and I was with the firm for about five and a half years. Most of my work was in manufacturing transformations, large industrial organizations. And uh, I think there you saw leadership in action a lot more. When you see a guy who's a plant head and how he's managing a plant in a difficult, hostile t place, you learn so much. And uh, the kind of respect that they command because of their choice of decisions that they make during crunch times is what really was the insight. You know, you can always choose an expedient path, but they've chosen the tougher path and that they're respected by the community for that. So I learned a lot from my clients, to be honest, in that uh, period. I moved to Chennai from Mumbai in 2008 uh, because my parents were aging and my daughter was born and we thought her being with grandparents is important. But then my clients were all over the country and so the travel was just becoming too intense. And uh, so I decided to move back to the industry and joined Ashok Leland. Initially, I was involved in product planning because product development in commercial vehicles was going through a big upgrade. And uh, I played my role in setting up that process. Then I was asked to look at corporate strategy, where again we said, you know, in general, strategies in companies, have large companies have been statements of intent rather than a plan to be achieved. Uh, Leyland wanted to transition from the former to the latter. And so it's not just a strategy, but how do you make it into a five-year plan, a one-year plan with a decided purpose and objective? was the problem statement and that we executed pretty well. The company wanted to be in the top 10 in trucks and top 5 in buses by 2019 and it hit that number in 2019. So setting up those processes is, was one of my role. And then uh, spent a stint in marketing, primarily around dealer development and lastly was brought back to the head office to be part of the turnaround effort in the company. How the, long were you and Ashok Leila? Seven years. So it was that the last bit that sort of exhausted me because turnarounds are never pleasant. We achieved our objectives, but I was left feeling empty. I also felt that this is a once in five year phenomenon. Maybe the next one won't be this bad because we've done structural changes, but it will be there. And third, uh, it also started, you know, in the automotive industry, you hardly get credit for the economic value that you're adding, but you get a lot of flack for you know, pollution, traffic, accidents, and that, it wasn't nice. And I decided to move on. And that's when... Uh, that's very interesting. So the feedback loop for the results that you generate is often far out into the horizon. Yes. But the adverse feedback loop is much more so... Which mm. is, you know, bad news travels faster. Yeah. And that's always there. But, uh, you know, at... When you're 40 and you've done a lot, you know what the intent of the industry is and you still get flack. It becomes too much beyond the point. So that's when I said, maybe it's time to move on. We've learned something. Hmm. With due humility, maybe there is horizontal transfer of learning possible. And that's when uh, my mentors suggested that explore a few ideas. If And if you are 
picking up one that delivers some social value as well we will create a pool and invest in you and that's how way cool started we evaluated different ideas but this how, came how do you and sanjay know each other so uh, my sanjay boss uh, has been my boss off and on for more than 30 years in my past job and we were family friends and therefore uh, i knew sanjay since he was young and he was one of my one of my former bosses who suggested that hey let's kick around a few ideas and if you can deliver something that generates social impact then i will fund you and i will get in, uh, the initial set of investors to fund you was that so the, the first set of cap uh, formal capital the first that set of formal did. capital that we got and he said why don't you have a chat with sanjay sanjay used to be bouncing off ideas even before and uh, this one clicked to be honest all right i know this will sound a little bit of a like a cliched question but as a parent versus as a ceo and founder what are either the similarities or differences or just the different experiences that you've had like you know uh, many of the founders that i've met tend to consider their companies also like a child in many ways right like you know uh, deep kalra of make my trip for instance right so how do you view parenting i mean sorry what um, i forgot to ask you your daughter's name shriya shriya so parenting shriya uh, what has it revealed to yourself about the similarity is you've got to adapt yourself to how they change as they grow so uh, it's hard i mean for me she's still the baby that i held in my hands but she's got a mind of her own she's not afraid to speak it and she will challenge you intellectually which is exactly what your colleagues will do in your company as you get more and more professionals or you be more and more professional and therefore your role shifts from you know largely you don't dictate anymore you recommend then you suggest then you submit so those shifts start happening occasionally you'll have to deep dive and dictate because i mean she is still an adolescent sometimes you've got to lay down the law but most of the times we are you know literally problem solving together on what can be done that's similar but the analogy that you mentioned is something that i've been battling with there are two views one is that you should be dispassionate and detached about your company and take decisions that are economically the right answer and the other view is what you said that you should be like a parent it's your child it's a struggle most of the folks who you interact with are stakeholders who have financial interest in the organization even your employees are i would say 80% of them have financial interest 20% are your true warriors in that case dispassionate is the right answer but it's hard it's very hard where you basically committed into something with so much passion to actually say that okay i and in many ways myself. you've given it life true you brought it you know into the world out of nothing true it's really hard to let go uh, i think i'm at a phase of life where it's becoming easier to let go and uh, since the same thing is happening with the daughter i'm sort of preparing myself mentally i mean she, yeah, she, she's going to be on her own question soon. she has 16 i have a 13 year old son do you end up thinking about the number of years that you have with shriya uh, while she's at home before she leaves for college all the time then... <laughs> all the time that's literally top of the mind you know the one thing that is you know really causing pressure is the competition between the attention that your company demands and your child needs or what you think your child needs she may not but uh, it's very limited time after that the only option is that where she goes i go somewhere nearby and be available you shouldn't impose yourself either but you should be available so that's that's really the phase where we i guess i am in right now I wanted to reference something back when you were talking about like you know how your relationship with Shreya has changed to more of I mean it's it's sort of like a mentor or coach right and earlier in the conversation at least twice I caught you mentioning somebody was a mentor I think the Siddhi Vinayak founder and then when you talked about when you started Way Cool you said there were people who were your mentors it looks like you've had the good fortune of having mentors and i think you're also accepting of mentors could you tell us about like you know i mean what's your how do you view mentorship and how do you approach it in a way that it's actually beneficial for both mentors as well as mentees 
I think uh, the word is often misunderstood. I think you should... Uh, it's a combination of role modeling and uh, sparring partnership and coaching. These are the three roles that in my view a mentor plays. There are people whom I am sort of like an ekalavya for them, right? They have never met me, but I follow them closely. That's role modeling. I'm saying, look at this guy, I mean, like Satish. I have met Satish socially, but he had the resilience to fight the resistance that he would have faced when he launched Paneer in South India, right? Mm. And that's something that I really admire and I keep following folks like those. And that's watch from a distance and admire. That's role modeling. The second is coaching. We go through tough times in startups and uh, there are times where you literally have broken down and not know what to do. And when who's, the, who's that person you call who says, look, listen to me, do these things. And you'll come out of the spot that you're in and things become better. That's the coaching piece. And the third is sparring partnership. It's literally your boxing. They're not your coach, but they're giving a counter view. And that's also mentorship in my view. Of course, you spar with your colleagues. But sparring with them, uh, somebody who is your mentor is slightly different. They also give you tips. They also tell you why they are saying what they are saying. Your colleagues are... They are not an interested way. party in that they're sense. There is no power dynamic between you exactly. and them as well. So they are freer to describe why. And you, your colleagues will never tell you why beyond a point. So those are the uh, roles I believe a mentor should play. And yes, I have definitely been fortunate. And... Uh, there are a lot of folks whom I look up to. Thank you so much, Karthik. It has been a fascinating conversation. And thank you for all the time that you shared with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to First Principles, the fortnightly leadership podcast from the Ken. If you like our work, please tell us. Rate or review First Principles wherever you get your podcast from. This goes a long way for us. This episode was hosted by Rohin Dharmakumar, that's me, and produced by my colleague Anushka Mukherjee. The audio editing is also by another colleague, Rajiv CN, our audio engineer. Lastly, if you aren't subscribed to our weekly companion newsletter, also called First Principles, head over to the ken.com slash first hyphen principles and look us up. It is the perfect laid back Sunday newsletter to accompany our podcast. But don't take my word for it. Check us out. <laughs>